So Wheaton Public Library is excited to be partnering with the parents group DEI 200, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council for School District 200 to offer the series Talking About Race to be held the first Thursday of the month at seven o'clock. The aim of this series is to provide a comfortable space for conversation about how to discuss race with others, including your family. Our next program in the series will be held November 5th and we'll discuss the topic of white fragility and white privilege. More information on that to come soon. It's not on the calendar quite yet. Tonight is our first program of the series and our topic is the issue of being colorblind. Ideally, everyone would be treated equally regardless of skin color, but we know we are not living in a perfect world. So we'll be talking about the concept of being colorblind in our imperfect world. So I'm so happy to introduce our first presenter and facilitator for tonight's program and member of DEI 200, Anjali Baradwa. So I'll hand it over to you now, Anjali. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you, Courtney. Um, hi guys, my name is Anjali Baradwa. Um, we're gonna bore you a little bit with a PowerPoint presentation here too. So um, I'm gonna- So just so you guys know who I am, my name is Anjali Baradwa. Um, I am obviously an Indian person, first generation where my parents were born in India. Um, we are talking a lot about CUSD 200. So I'm a local mom. Um, I have kids at Madison, Edison and Wheaton Warrenville South. Um, I actually don't have any official background in the subject of DEI or, you know, whether we should be colorblind or not. Um, I'm actually a Microsoft consultant project manager by day, but I do try to do my part at night. So I am, um, you know, an activist and uh, always trying to um, do the right thing more than anything. Um, I'm the creator of DEI 200 and also on the um, CUSD 200 equity task force. So what is DEI 200? You guys have been hearing this term um, on and off. And so DEI 200, we're the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council for CUSD 200. Um, our mission is pretty simple, to amplify voices with dialogue and action for District 200, commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion, and strive for everyone in our community to have a feeling of belonging, to have the sense of belonging. So if you're curious about the kinds of stuff that we're gonna be doing um, and that we've started off, this, this group started in the um, summer and I saw even the question already come in is how we got started. Um, you know, essentially it's something that we've seen um, Naperville do and Naperville will be very successful with it. And I was hoping to have that same kind of community and, and, and kind of um, initiative here in Wheaton. So we started it. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is trying to get more student engagement. So, um, you know, or kind of focusing on the students, obviously, where we're looking at some of the curriculum that the kids are doing. Sometimes it's not always, um, you know, uh, appropriate for everyone. You know, some, sometimes they have inappropriate words or the history has been kind of whitewashed. So we're trying to provide alternative curricular um, ideas in some cases, or just, you know, being aware of what else is out there. We're trying to get the students engaged, um, whether it be with additional training um, or perhaps in a club environment for the older kids. And then we're also trying to get the community engaged as well. So talking, um, doing events, just like the one that we have today, as well as, you know, multicultural days and book clubs, and then also do um, outreach. So um, we're reaching out to communities that might have been underrepresented um, in terms of the school district in the past, um, addressing things that might be holding people back, and then just reaching out. You guys might have seen the survey that was presented. Um, you know, uh, a couple weeks back, and we're trying to get a feeling for where are we in this community when it comes to this topic. So that's a, just a little brief introduction to DEI 200. Um, I want to give each panelist an opportunity to present themselves. So Erica, would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm so honored to be here tonight. I think this is a great conversation that we're about to have tonight. Um, so my husband and I moved to Wheaton, just a little background. In 1996, we raised our two boys, so we are a District 200 family, and we, um, the, our boys are now out in college, having a good time under COVID. And I'm also a high school social studies teacher up at Glenbard North. I teach both government and psychology, so this has been a topic that's near and dear to my heart and my teaching, and um, partially through the Illinois Education Association, my teachers association, I'm on the racial and social justice committee. So again, by no means am I an expert, um, but it's definitely an issue I'm passionate about. And then most recently, I was elected to the Wheaton City Council. Um, so, you know, I, I do feel over the summer when I went to some of the um, events in Adams Park, I felt an obligation to start to speak up if I have 
a little bit of power, a little bit of leadership that um, I should be part of the discussion. So thank you once again for being here. Great, and Rachel? Hey everyone, um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, so I am Rachel Bautista, I am a proud Latina. My parents are from Bolivia, South America, um, and I'm a mother to a three-year-old boy. Um, I've only lived in Wheaton for about two and a half years, but I actually grew up in neighboring Elmhurst, so I'm very familiar with the DuPage County area. Um, I'm also here today to represent the City of Wheaton Community Relations Commission, um, and I'm also a member of DEI 200 and the Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, my background is actually in marketing, um, but similar to Anjali and Erica, um, I'm here really not as an expert, but more as just sharing my own person, personal experiences as someone who is a person of color. So I do want to give uh, you know, accolades to both Anjali and uh, Courtney for putting this on because I do think it's a very important discussion that everyone should be having. So I really am excited to see this forum and really look forward to participating in, in the discussion with everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Next, we have Mary. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Aboa, and I have lived in Wheaton for a pretty long time. In fact, I enjoyed going to the library back when the carpet was yellow and orange stripes or squares or something. Um, and so I say that to say I have some deep roots in the community, and um, I've enjoyed uh, both attending Wheaton schools and sending um, our kids, our four kids, to uh, District 200 schools as well. We have a ninth grader at North, seventh grader at Monroe, and two fourth graders at Pleasant Hill School. I work during the day as the Director of Graduate Student Life here at Wheaton College, and I'm excited to be on this call because I love engaging the community in conversations that matter and have impacted my family in, in really meaningful ways, and so I'm excited to be here. Thank, thankful uh, very much to the library and to Anjali for putting this on. Thanks, Mary. And Michael. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael McCoy. I uh, moved to Wheaton in 2014, and I am a um, uh, professor at Wheaton College. I teach uh, politics and international relations, particularly international relations. Um, and so, yes, as it says, I have uh, three children, uh, one who is a third grader at Lincoln Elementary and two younger ones, both born here in the community, one who will be starting at Lincoln, Lord willing, next year. We'll see what happens with craziness that is existence right now. Uh, and then a 20-month-year-old uh, son. And um, I got connected to Anjali through a mutual friend, and I was very glad to be able to speak on a topic that um, is very important to me. I, I study uh, international relations, which Inter intersects a lot of the uh, issues that we talk about in terms of how we think about race. But like many of the other panelists have said, I really speak into this more as uh, an African-American and through my personal experience. But a lot of times I think about my personal experience through what I study and teach. So thankful to be here tonight. Awesome. All right, so that's our group of panelists. Um, so continuing forward, we're kind of going to speak to the moment a little bit. Um, <laughs> unless you've been living under a rock, you know that there is a lot of stuff that's happening, um, you know, kind of throughout the, the nation right now. But let's, particularly here in Wheaton, we've seen a lot of activity too. There were multiple rallies and protests, um, you know, shortly after George Floyd's murder that, you know, Wheaton people were talking about why the, and, and recognizing for the first time um, the racial inequities in American life. So we had the signs that were created by the Wheaton area moms. There was plenty of different protests. So this is something that Wheaton, you know, the residents of Wheaton want to talk about. Um, so we're starting to see a reckoning to the extent of institutional racism throughout America. Um, there's unprecedented motivation by people of all races. Um, you're not just seeing it like a smaller group, what we did, you know, back in Ferguson, for example. This is um, the, it's becoming a little bit broader. And, and I think that's um, trying to leverage that passion a little bit and start talking about these subjects. Um, we recognize that participating in these discussions can be hard. Um, you know, the work is not easy. If you feel slightly uncomfortable, like that's okay, it's natural, it, that's all right. Um, what are our goals for talking about this subject? Well, our goals are that we're not gonna end discrimination, right? Um, but we have to have these conversations to start us on a path towards addressing it. And trying to address racism in the entire world, get, that can feel daunting, um, but we can affect ourselves and the community and spaces that we interact with. And this is why I'm really focused and, and, and so happy again that the library put this on to do it within the Wheaton community. 
Um, so our goal is that you leave the discussion feeling more informed than when you started or more motivated to be informed and you are empowered to influence the spaces in which you interact. So like Courtney discussed, um, we're, we're starting a, a series talking about race. We're still fine, finalizing and fine tuning um, bits. Uh, today, obviously, is the first one, should we be colorblind? Um, I'm still working on the title on the second one, but something along the lines of what it means to be white with white fragility, um, as well as white privilege. And then we're going to get more into systemic racism and um, becoming an anti-racist, which a lot of people do want to jump into. But we do feel it's important to touch on some of these other subjects first before you start, you know, go right into um, becoming an anti-racist. So we'll definitely touch into these subjects in the future. Don't think that we're not talking about systemic racism just because we're not talking about it today. All right, so I want you guys all to take a minute to imagine a situation, right? So we're all part of this Wheaton community. Um, you know, again, we focus on CUSD 200. So you hear about a um, school fundraiser, PTA fundraiser, it's going to be a game night. So you're great at trivia, you're super excited, you picture something along these lines right? You get there and you realize that there was this red carpet theme that you weren't aware of and everybody is dressed to the nines. They all have tuxes on, they're in their cocktail dresses, and you're here in your jeans and a t-shirt. Do you guys notice? How does it make you feel? Does it make you feel a bit self-conscious? Do you think other people notice? So this is one of those analogies that I think is the most helpful to understand that when someone who looks different from the majority walks into a room, whether it be a classroom, a coffee shop, a boardroom, PTA event, people notice. So here's the question, should we be colorblind? Um, I guess, Courtney, do we have the answers to the polls? Where, where, where did we land? <laughs> so it looks like 9% says yes, skin color doesn't matter, and that was five people. 79% okay. said no, skin color matters, that was 46 people. And then 12% uh, said I'm not sure, which was seven people. Good. We definitely have a, a variety here, um, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll address it. So um, what are some of the reasons why we've heard about like not seeing color? So I think it's important to acknowledge that for a lot of people, the intention is good right? We're trying to say that color doesn't matter to me. I treat everybody the same, right? Um, and that pointing out the differences will just make things worse. And so I do, you know, we do recognize that that definitely comes from a good place. Um, there are some people out there that believe that we've achieved equality already, so we don't need to talk about it anymore. Um, we'll probably get a little bit more into that, into systemic racism. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, again, a lot of people are coming to this with good intentions. And recently there was um, a quote unquote famous person uh, who talked about racial colorblindness. So when former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz, Schultz was asked about the two black men who were arrested in a Philadelphia Starbucks, he replied, as somebody who grew up in a very diverse background and as a young boy in the projects, I didn't see color as a young boy and I honestly don't see color now. Schultz claimed that he was colorblind. So we've heard it from really good, you know, I've heard it from really good friends. I've heard it from, you know, um, people across the community. So it's not like we're trying to judge anybody who has had this thought process before. Again, we understand that it comes from good intentions. One of the things that I find really interesting, um, you know, I'd love to show you guys the, the where this image is from. Does anybody recognize it? It's from um, Disney's Moana. And so while I'd like to play the whole movie for you, obviously I can't do that. Um, at the end, there's this really powerful scene that talks about um, not forgetting who you are and keeping your, tra uh, your traditions. And so the uh, answer to this question of should we be colorblind is articulated really, really well by um, Rail Nelson James. So I'm gonna play this short video clip. It's about two minutes. So you guys can get a little bit of a feeling for um, you know, a, a different perspective. I want to pick up on another question um, that we got from Facebook from Holly, which is a really simple question. I think you'll have a strong reaction to it. Um, how about mo not focusing on color at all? How about leaving race out of the workplace and that conversation? You know, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I do have a strong reaction to it. And my reaction is that 
I, I love being black. I love being a black woman. It is a centering and central part of my identity. It connects me to my foremothers. It connects me to women who are all around the diaspora. And it's a really special and cherished part of my identity. I want people to see it. I want people to appreciate me because of it, not in spite of it. And while we talk in this moment a lot about the deficits and the burdens of being a person of color at work, people of color are excited about their, you know, cherish their heritage, the thing that makes them them. And one of the things that makes us us, I should say. And so colorblindness fundamentally misses the mark by erasing something that's important to people's self-identity and people's self-love. Um, and that's not the way to navigate through relationships. It's not the way to navigate through building community, but rather seeing me more fully and understanding um, the lens through which I see the world, or at least trying and making an attempt to do that um, is what matters to me. And, and I want to just, you know, emphasize that is the job of uh, that people of color have done our entire lives like we know a lot about what it's like being white in america because we've watched television our whole lives we've been presented with literature in our formal schooling that has given us a huge understanding of whiteness in this country and and eurocentric topics more broadly um and so I'm going to cut her off there. She speaks really eloquently about the subject, but um, I think that she really gives a great, a great answer to this idea of, of whether we should be colorblind. So essentially at the end of the day, colorblind does contribute to, colorblindness contributes to racism. Um, and so why are, why, why are some of those reasons, okay? Or what are some of those reasons? Number one, it's disingenuous. Just like we talked about when you walk into that room and you saw the people in the tuxes um, and the cocktail dresses versus um, your jeans and a t-shirt, you can see it. For you to not say that you, to say that you don't see it, it's just honestly disingenuous. Um, it also considers white as the default, right? Meaning that anybody of color is something different um, to, to, to say that you don't see color. Um, it also can invalidate some racist experiences, which kind of goes to the meme on the left here. So um, saying that you experience something and you believe that it's because of your skin color, um, you know, if they don't see color, they don't ex understand how that might happen. Um, it also equates color as something negative. Um, I'm a brown woman. I love being a brown woman. I, I don't think that's negative at all. I'm like, like she said, I'm proud. Um, so you don't want to equate color with something negative can also absolves you from seeking uh, diversity. So, you know, thinking about, are there any people of color in your circles, um, at work, in your community, and from your faith base, are there any, um, you know, people of color for allow you to see those different perspectives? It ignores racial disparity, and people who know color makes a difference won't trust you. So that's the, um, introduction to colorblindness, and then I'm gonna actually turn it over to Erica, uh, and so Erica, I'll go ahead and mute myself and you can get started. Great. Thank you for mentioning the mute because I for, almost forgot <laughs> that I needed to <laughs> unmute. Um, so uh, thank you once again. And I, I do find it an honor and a privilege to be here tonight with my quite honestly limited resources. Um, our focus, like we, like Anjali had so nicely said, our, our goal, our hope for tonight is that you keep learning, you keep researching. So when our sort of organic group here tonight came together with the library under Courtney's leadership, um, we were brainstorming about how to address this topic and you know where to even begin. And we definitely needed to just kind of start somewhere. Um, personal stories are, are essential, are important, but we also wanted to make sure um, we brought in what research we could um, what investigations we could. Um, so I have the privilege of, do, of giving you a little bit of information. And like I said, I am a teacher. I teach government and psychology. And so um, I have a little bit of a background in some of the historical research. So we'll get to the next slide. Thank you. So some of you may or may not have heard of this uh, study, the, what's now known as the Dahl test. Um, and again, I teach psychology and government, and I tell my students year in, year in and year out, this is one of my 
favorite examples because it merges psychology and government together. And, and we'll see that here in a minute if you're not familiar with this. So the doll test by Kenneth and Mamie Clark, and you can see their images there, um, both African-American psychologists. As a matter of fact, Kenneth was the first African-American president of the American Psychological Association, um, very well studied. At the very early 40s, they did uh, studies on the effects of segregation, and they did this doll test. So you see the lower image is uh, basically they presented African-American children with a white doll and a black doll. And then they had, this, had the children choose. Overwhelmingly, the children chose the white doll as the more favored doll. Um, the white doll would be um, focused on when there were positive statements. Um, and the black doll would be just the opposite. They even came away with, um, you know, I have some of the, the conclusions. Um, their studies proved that inferiority and lower self-esteem among these African-American children were definitely evident. They even varied their studies between children that were in segregated schools and children that were in, not in segregated schools, but the evidence was overwhelming. Uh, they even referred to by the age of five. So children by this age of five had self-hate self was more evident especially in students who were who attended segregated schools. So, so already at the age of five, um, children are feeling this. And, and a lot of research now has shown, and, and quite honestly, in the world of education, we've known this for a long time, that kids need to see themselves. They need to see diverse individuals in general and in positive role models. Um, and what positive role, mo role models look like. They need to see themselves in that, and that builds self-esteem, and, and that matters. Um, so then we switch um, to the next slide, which, like I said, I've, I expressed to my students, this is when I get really excited because psychology and government combine, um, and that doesn't always happen. So the study, the doll test, was presented and included and cited in the famous Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas case. And I imagine most of you have heard of this. I did want to emphasize the case was decided on a nine to zero. Um, that's not common, right? For a unanimous decision for all nine Supreme Court justices to unequivocally agree that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. This sent a landmark message to America at this time. And the message was basically the effects of segregation and racism in this country and that we can't survive that way. Um, now, what's been interesting too, a lot of the studies, and again, because we have limited time, this would definitely be the doll test. You can look up the doll test. So I'd encourage you to jot that down right now. And the doll test has been replicated. And so we have a short little video. We're just going to watch. Um, let, we can just watch a minute of it. And I think um, participants here tonight will get an understanding. Quale bambola è bianca? Quale bambola è nera? Quale delle due è bella? Mm, questa. Qual è quella bella? Qual è quella brutta? E qual è quella buona? Quale è cattiva? Qual è buona? Yeah, thank 
you for so um, that just gives an example. And again, you can find these um, studies that have been done and replicated. Um, but it's just a very powerful visual to explain. I mean, these are young kids, and they're even, you know, obviously in another country. So color has meaning. Um, color has a lot of meaning and different meaning to different people. Um, and quite honestly, the, you know, the takeaway from this is that we need to acknowledge the real effects of our experiences and the long-term long impact, and even children identify this. So I'm gonna move through the last two slides real quickly here. Um, again, one of our goals tonight was to give you some, some research, some uh, interest, some ideas for you to continue in your search and your quest for some insight um, and knowledge. So the Kaiser Foundation here, um, along with CNN, published a, a survey in 2015. Um, it had a, quite a few takeaways on race. And one of the interesting facts I wanted to point out and have you do a little more research in yourselves is this idea of how um, people of color are represented in the media, um, how they're portrayed in the media. And what I thought was most fascinating about this particular question, not just how they're portrayed in the media, but how people of color actually interpret how they're being portrayed. So it's that, um, the video that Anjali showed, it's that lens that we're all looking through and we all have a very different lens to look through. Um, and then the, fin the final um, study I wanted to point out is the implicit bias or unconscious bias. And I also think that that's gonna start to get into that we'll talk more about that in the systemic racism um, section. But another thing for you to, to dig into, and, and you'll need to dig deep, is this implicit association test. Harvard University has run this and has been reviewing this. A couple of years ago, it received some negative review. Um, the picture to the bottom right is basically the test you take. You see an image of a black person or a white person, and you very quickly cognitively go to bad or good. Um, it's definitely a long, it's a very difficult concept to quantify. Um, and it's really not that simple. Um, and again, if you take a deeper dive into this, it's, it's first, it's very fascinating and insightful for yourself. Um, but Harvard University is, is definitely taking the long-term approach to look at this data and quantify this data um, to be able to, to study how we have and how we experience implicit or unconscious bias. So, so those are basically a couple of pieces of research for you to take a look at um, and, and just continue that conversation and have that dialogue. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over back to Anjali now, and I think we're going to get into our question and answer sec section. Thank you, Erica. I appreciate that. And so I think that um, question actually flows really well into the first question that I'm going to give to Rachel, um, which is when we're talking about being colorblind, is that concept li limited to the skin color that we see? Yeah, and so the reality is, is that it's not. I think when we look at majority of communities of color, their race and ethnicity, it extends beyond just what you physically see. It's represented in their names, the languages they speak, and really core parts of their identities that are so closely tied to racial and ethnic, ethnic identities. And speaking from my own experience, um, when people meet me for the first time, they assume I'm white. Um, but when they see my last name, when they hear me speak Spanish, when they meet my parents, that's when they really start to, that's when they realize that I'm Latina. And so, and in some instances, that's when biases are formed or they start to, you know, assumptions about me are made. And so I think it's really important to understand that color is not in just what you see, but it lives in what you read, what you hear. Um, and I think it's good to kind of keep in the back of their minds because, you know, as you look at some, you know, communities of color, it, it can be a motivation for people to anglicize their, their name because of the reality of these biases. You know, they don't want people to see them differently or they don't want these biases to prevent them from getting a job or prevent them from, you know, having a conversation, you know, it's just these negative perceptions come about. So, um, you know, color really lives everywhere. And so um, it's important to, to recognize that. Awesome. Anybody want to add to anything there? 
All right, um, Courtney, do we have anybody uh, queued up for Q and A yet? Not yet. Um, the main question is: is will the PowerPoint be available afterwards? Uh, we can make it available for sure. We can send it out with our. Um, I think our intention is to send out a list of resources as well. Rachel actually put that together, so we can include that with um, with with the resources. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to go to some of the questions that um, we have put together then, which is what is the historical or socio-political context of colorblind ideology? Michael, I was thinking about throwing that one to you, if that's okay. <laughs> okay, I thought you were going to start with Mary on that one. Uh, could you say that? Could you ask that again? Sure, and I can if you'd like. Um, what is the historical or socio-political context of colorblind ideology? Um, I think it really comes from, as you, uh, Anjali, I think strongly emphasized when you uh, were going through your PowerPoint, I think, you know, it comes from a positive place of looking at a past where discrimination is based on race. And so you just think the natural, you know, fix for that, natural antidote is let's not focus on race. So I think it comes from a place of um, wanting to break down barriers, but I think it also, I mean, I, again, I think there was just, there were so many good things about the bullet points. I mean, I really thought you had a lot of good points and a really, and this was not pre-planned. I just, you know, just really felt like it was, it was really good because you also talked about how what it does is it, um, I don't think this is quite the word you use, but it, it sort of it normalizes what you said default. It makes default. whiteness the default because it's sort of like, well, if we're colorblind, then what are we seeing or, or what, then what's normal, right? And so it normalizes whiteness and everything else is, um, different, exotic, special, but it's not normalized. And so it's, so it then becomes another way of saying that what it means to be an American and in a way kind of even a person is to be white and everything else is again, special, different, exotic. Um, and it's not, I don't think, again, it, no one wants to use the word inferior but it's still like, and, and again, I, and I think that historical context is one of seeking to rectify the superficial parts of racial discrimination without getting at the roots of the fact that it's still a very white based way of thinking about America and the world. Yeah. Um, a side tidbit on that, we often talk about like Indian weddings, right? Like we went to an Indian wedding and, you know, somebody went to an Indian wedding and um, I'm American actually. So my wedding is an American wedding. It wasn't an Indian wedding. Now it had Indian heritage, but I find myself saying that. So again, it's talking about that white is the default, right? That, that, that um, our culture is not American. Um, yeah. That, that, oh, just to, and just to add to that, that exactly. If we're talking about anything else, we don't put adjectives on things that are white. And, and I would say it wouldn't occur to me to do so either. Right. But like, I don't think no one called Iron Man the white hero movie, but, but Black Panther is the black hero movie. Right. I mean, his name is even Black Panther. So like, so things like that. Great. So Courtney, um, feel free to jump in if you have uh, somebody ready to go. I think so. Lauren, go ahead. If you're able to. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you. I, I love that you kind of started out the conversation with this is this can be uncomfortable. It needs to be uncomfortable because otherwise, what are we doing? Um, <laughs> that's how change happens. Um, my question is that it seems like being colorblind, and it, it kind of sounded like where you were going a moment ago anyway. Being colorblind is a, is a function of privilege. You know, it doesn't seem like that's something that people of color have the privilege or the luxury of being. Are people of color ever claiming or, or saying that they are also colorblind or is that a, a white function? We didn't have assignments for people for uh, audience questions. So who wants to take that one? I, I'm willing to jump go, in. To start go ahead, Michael. Uh, that's a really good question. I think, um, I think that like when we talk about colorblindness, it's, it's kind of part of our language. So, I think that there, people of color might also say that because they would associate it with, I'm not looking at race for discriminatory reasons. So they might say I'm colorblind. But again, I, I go back to what Anjali, that the example of what it means to walk into a room and be the only one. And 
when you walk into a room and be the only one, the weird thing is, as a person of color, your color, it's like the color, of the like your color stands out to you, less so the color of the room, because you might even be sort of, like for me, I can speak to my own personal experience. I might be used to walking into a room that's predominantly white, but yet still, depending on that context, particularly if it's a cultural context that I'm less familiar with, less comfortable with, I will then suddenly feel my blackness. So I think that even as people of color, we might use the term colorblindness because we understand the idea behind it is meant to say to be non-discriminatory, but we also know that there's a certain script we have to speak in. Like colorblindness is, as I think Rachel said this, it's it's not only just the the way you look, it's the way you talk, it's the way you act. And so if you want to be colorblind, as a person of color, you know the script you have to engage in, and that's almost to decolorize yourself. Like a blending, like just trying to blend in. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly. Yeah. Thank There's you. Al um, also to uh, kind of go a little bit more to your point too, um, uh, with the question of like, is it only a white function? And, and I think that actually goes really well into the, the next, one of the questions that we, did, we talked about discussing today is how, um, are there people of color who don't like to be talked about as different or don't want to address being treated differently or, or, or frankly don't think that there should be, um, you should see color uh, and everybody should be treated equally. Um, so, I mean, there's definitely also this idea of, you know, not everybody's the same. Every single person is different. So if you ask, um, you know, one Indian woman this question versus another one, you might get a completely different answer, right? Um, but I also think there is a other component to it as well. Um, Rachel, I was gonna toss this to you too, but I, I will in a second. I, I also wanna include the fact that like, sometimes talking about the fact that we're different and, and bringing these issues to attention can ostracize yourself in a bit in a way that you're already feeling different. So now we wanna talk about, you know, why my skin color affects me differently and then you feel even more different. So it's hard. There's a sacrifice with talking about this and having this conversation. So um, not everybody wants to talk about it. Some people not, may not see it that way, but um, you know, there, there's lots of different opinions out there. So Rachel, did you wanna to add to that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting because uh, when I look back to, I guess the first time I became aware of someone treating me differently because of my race was probably around elementary school. And so obviously the perspective I have as an adult versus a child, it has changed dramatically. But I remember, and I grew up in, in a predominantly white community, so a lot of my friends were white. And so I remember when that happened, I, I knew this wasn't something that I could talk about to my friends because in my mind, they just wouldn't understand or they couldn't relate to what it means to be like of a different race, a different ethnicity. And so really it was just like my family I could talk about. Um, but then it was also a little bit of, I guess, shock, like, you know, when it happened, I was like, did that really just happen? Did I misunderstand that? Because I guess in my mind, like, I'm, you know, proud of my Bolivian heritage, proud to be a Latina. And so for someone to have a negative perception or, you know, perception of something I'm proud in, you know, as a child was hard, like I couldn't reconcile those. And so now as an adult, it's, it's very different because I think as um, I, when I went to college and, you know, grad school, even like as a sort of my, you know, friend community became much more representative of me, it changed so much. And I felt very comfortable talking about and celebrating, you know, who would my identity. So it's definitely evolved a lot. And I'm definitely not, don't shy away from those conversations. But even now as an adult, when I have conversations with my other friends of, you know, color, like, you know, why don't you talk about it? Like some of the reactions are more that, some of them are just tired of the conversations. They, it's just, again, gets back to this relatability and that, you know, I keep having the same conversations. I keep trying to bring this up and I just don't feel like anyone really understands. Like, it's kind of like a fruitless effort. Um, and then I think there's also, I think you had kind of pointed this out that like, you know, your experience is very different than like someone else who's Indian's experience and similar with mine. And so it's more like, why do I have to, some of my friends feels like, why do I have to be the one to educate everybody? You know, like I, you know, but, but when you look at some of those challenges, yes, it's understandable, but it's also all the more reason we should be talking about it because the more we talk about it, the more those challenges will go away and it becomes a lot easier. Um, but, you know, so again, it, you know, it was really interesting when I thought about this question, like how much my own experiences have evolved, what I felt as a child to what I feel as an adult. And then again, the conversations I've had even with my adult friends. And, and I would also say to recognition of just how much the time has changed because 
you know, as a child, I was like back in the eighties. <laughs> and so like, just, you just didn't have these type. I don't feel like there was having these conversations were even being had. And now, yes, these conversations are being had, but still need more work that needs to be done. And we need to do more to progress those conversations. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to throw one to Mary, uh, Courtney, if you're getting ready for the next one, if that's okay. Yep. Um, all right, Mary, you're up. So I'm going to ask you, um, what are the consequences of colorblindness in education? Thank you for asking because I'm wearing a shirt that actually says that every child deserves a black teacher. And I understand this to be a rather contested idea. And the reason it's so significant is I think it is a direct counterclaim to the abstract notion of race that we hold in society today, moving away from a historic context of where race as a social construct meant nothing other than uh, the subordination of darker skinned people and the superiority of white people for uh, obvious reasons connected to slavery and economic gain. And the reason I share that is because if we talk about colorblindness, we need to talk about racial categories. That's what it's really rooted in. And if we unpack the different racial categories over time, we'll recognize that initially race was only and ever a status race hierarchy. It existed to divide poor black and poor white people and more easily identify. Other than that, it would be as arbitrary as the size of one's ears or any other physical marker. So race has absolutely no real meaning but with ample efforts to prove it's scientifically tr true, now debunked, we've had to move on to the recognition that race still matters on the census and other categories in what we now call formal race. Formal race categories intentionally disconnected or unconnected these categories from any historic or social meaning in an effort to move, or at least theoretically move beyond overt racism. Now, whether you could say that was a move of racial progress or whether it was an evolution of the racial status quo. I would leave everyone on this call to think through that for themselves. I'm just posing the possibility that the way in which we wish to use racial categories today is definitely the formal race category where we would like to say, we're all the same. The racial categories are very real, worth checking on a box, but they hold no meaning in terms of somebody's actual historic or current uh, experience in the world today or in the US. A different way, of course, of thinking about race and how it matters for education is what we could call a historical race category, where we're recognizing that the substance of these racial categories are alive and well today, whether or not we think or wish to believe that we live in a post-racial society, particularly with the election of former President Barack Obama. Bringing that to education and also making it a little bit more personal and a little bit less uh, academic or intellectual is the fact that I have two biracial daughters and two adopted black sons. And the reason I bring that in and them as school children in our local public school is race categories are not binaries. We're not talking about obviously from the representation on this call, just a black white situation. We're talking about the racialization of people along the continuum. So one of my biracial daughters has darker skin than another and her experiences in school and in the community are different from one another. Further, as a white mom of adopted black children, if I were to take a colorblind approach to my parenting, I would assume that race or formal race, meaning I check a white box, has it's unconnected to historic and social meaning. It means my parenting or my capacity to parent my black children is unrelated to my race. And I can see how that thinking has been problematic in my parenting until I've learned and listened to people of color to see how some of these things play out. For example, in education, they are being raised in the same district that I was with very, very few teachers who look like them. Because we have bought into the idea of formal race, which is unconnected to their experience, meaning hiring more teachers of color is not consequential to the quality of the education they're receiving. And from my personal experience, I would say not only is that inadequate as a frame to disrupt long-standing gaps in education and in wealth and in housing and education, and I said that already, in every 
every area of society, a colorblind ideology is inadequate to address the social ills. Further, disregarding a teacher's race or ethnic background doesn't allow for a full appreciation of the diversity that they bring, meaning that it's not just kids of color who would benefit as they do as study after study has shown, but white kids will benefit from having teachers of different racial and ethnic backgrounds of their own as well. And that is why in my own life, I've, I've um, tried hard to sort of imagine a different way of thinking about what it means to be nice. In Wheaton, I think we're nice people. What it means to be nice sometimes isn't so nice. And that's what we're trying to, that's what I think uh, colorblind ideology does in public education. Thank you, Mary. Real quick, I was, um, I'm also darker than my sister and we also have very, very different experiences. And we, um, as adults, have come gone in different ways because of that, I think. Um, Courtney, do you have any, a question ready? Uh, no questions coming in, um, except for the, the emailed one okay. that I sent you. Angela, if you don't, yeah, if you don't mind if I just chime in, you know, being a public school teacher for 25 sure. plus years, um, and I don't have, you know, I'm not an administrator, so I'm not um, in a lot of the decision making. <laughs> However, I, I do believe in our community, I would like very much to say my experience has been that we're moving in the right direction, um, which is a, a start to say. Um, the, like I said at the beginning, my uh, Teachers Association, the IEA, I know the Illinois Federation of Teachers, um, we have long-standing policy, we have long-standing committees that are, are pushing for diversity, are doing studies and figuring how can we get more diverse uh, teachers in the classroom, um, administrators in the buildings, and I would like to I would like to believe, and, I, and my experience has been, although again, I'm not in the decision making rooms because I'm just a classroom teacher, um, that that is definitely questions and decisions and ideas that are being discussed at the important levels. Um, so I'd like to think as a community and then the, the Glenbard School District that we're moving that way as well. So once again, I'm very glad that we're having these conversations because that could be, should be opening this up. More. Uh, can I? Uh, oh, go ahead. Again, because I want to come back to something uh, Mary said about, and just in general about the importance of being, of having um, educators of different colors, different backgrounds. Um, I know for me, as um, uh, as a black professor here at Wheaton College, which is you know a majority white student body, you know sometimes when it when we have faculty of color here and we talk about mentoring and teaching responsibilities, a lot of times people think like, oh, we need, you know, we need black faculty, we need Latin faculty because we have those, you know, we need Asian faculty because we have these different students of, of color here. I actually said recently um, uh, in a formal setting that when it comes to issues of race, most of my mentorship is actually to white students because I'm probably one of the first, if not the first people of, of color that they've ever had as an educator or in a position of authority over them. And as we have gone through, and I've, again, I've been here since 2014, so I've been here for a lot of different issues of race that have happened on our campus, in our country. And I've become a, a trusted voice to students who really struggle with these issues. And, and so to, to Mary's point, I will say that uh, there's a perspective I have on life, an experience, or even the ways I understand my field that are just different from others who have had different experience, particularly in this context we're talking about, different racial experiences, right? Just in terms of how we think about, you know, American politics, American history. And there are just the different things I see and experience and can speak into that I think enriches um, the experience of our students. And it doesn't take away from the fact that they've had they've had you know educators of different races, but I can say okay, so this is one perspective on education. We agree on the facts. I'm going to give you a different perspective on how we could have seen this exact same thing. Uh, one of the things I like to emphasize is when we talk about um, when we talk about uh, you know the Civil War or, or just American history. It's like, do you think about people who were enslaved, do you think about them as Americans? Has it occurred to you that those were Americans who were enslaved? Because by any standard of being an American, 
they're born like if they were enslaved they were born in this country they worked in this country they had children in this country have you ever thought about the fact that these were americans too and you know this might make students nervous because they realize actually i never really did think about that i never really thought about them being americans until they were like officially freed if even that and it's like no they were americans even while they were under slavery they have a stake in what america is you know we should talk about when we talk about americans who were enslaved we shouldn't talk about not only what they suffered, but what they built and what they built in this country and the fact that they're Americans. And that's just a whole different way of thinking about American history, even though it's the exact same historical facts that have been taught, but just never thought about that way. And even I, as, as a black man, that's something I had to grow into the, thinking about and realizing about my own history, my own family uh, contribution to this country. You know, my, my sister dated back our history. We can date back our, our history in this country so the early uh, 1800s, and that's as far back as the records go. So, and so just having, so again, as Mary's saying, just having that different perspective that starts in the classroom, but it doesn't end there. And, it, and, and you can really build, and, and that builds into our kids. And it's not just about saying, you know, for, for me or for Mary having children who are black, oh, they need black mentors. That's true too, that's really important. But it's also about saying, there's something that we contribute to all of our community by having diverse backgrounds. Excellent. I think we could, I, I really like the idea of talking about the kids a lot too, um, especially with the DEI 200 focus is obviously on our students. So um, I wanted to ask the question about what is the right way to talk about race with my kids, right? Thinking back to the whole colorblind um, idea. So anybody want to start with that one? Mary, should I go with you first? Sure, I always want okay, to defer, defer to the group, but I can answer this one quickly. I've, I've gotten a lot of those questions, especially after George Floyd. I think some white parents are beginning to engage and say, how should we talk about uh, this issue to our kids? And one of the things I say, it's, a, it's gonna be an indirect uh, answer to your question, but um, the more that you choose to be intentional about making issues of American history of our communities integrated into your home life and family life, the less it needs to become an uncomfortable or abstract conversation. So just to give a quick example, I being white, recognize that my home naturally will, um, will include white artifacts, right? So maybe white paintings or books by white authors by default, because that's my cultural heritage. And so being intentional about filling our home with different um, artifacts from different racial backgrounds then invites dialogue and makes it more natural. I also bring my children when community events happen, such as the, the images that Anjali um, showed earlier. So not just talking to our kids about race, but inviting real live opportunities to engage our children. What um, adults are in your children's lives? Who are your close friends and family? If you go to, if you live in a largely white community, maybe you go to a mostly white church or whatever it may be, recognize who your children are growing up around, who are their role models, what voices are you presenting for them, what are you reading to them, and there's ways to really integrate it in that make the conversation less abstract and uh, more integrated into their lives. But I'm going to let somebody else answer another more practical way of actual conversations, which are also really important. Rachel, do you have something? I see you're unmuted. Yeah, no, I was just going to build on what Mary had shared. I think, I think the most important thing is don't shy away from it. You know, as Anjali had mentioned, this is an uncomfortable conversation. And I don't think there's really, like, there's no, I think it conti will continue to evolve as your child gets over. Like right now, when I have racial discussions with my son, he's three. So this concept of race, you know, at that young age, it's like with anything, like how do I break it down for him in a way that he's really going to understand it? So I think, you know, definitely don't shy away with it. And I think a good resource for us has been books and just not in the sense of books that talk about race, but more or less in the sense of being representative of the world. So I really want books that show all types of, you know, Asian, you know, African-American, Latino. It's really important for me, for him to see that there's a much bigger world out of what he may see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I want him I want him to be exposed to it and enough and also outside of books like in a more formal settings you know having friends that are you know different ethnicities and different you know races because i want it to be normal for him as he gets through the years i don't want it to be something where he knows this as different but more that it's the norm and so um i think as parents we all understand like 
how our kids are absorbing things. And I think it's just important to look at what are the different mediums that will allow me, allow them to be able to understand this concept of race. I also do want to give a plug for the Wien Public Library um, and their catalog section. They actually have like books like for kids that, you know, focus more on, um, you know, social justice and race. And so that's a really good starting point is just start to look through those books there um, because there's interesting perspectives around like, how can you, how do you talk about, how can you explain such a sometimes a very complex concept as race to a child? And I think a lot of these books have been great resources for me and my family to help, you know, my son start to comprehend a little bit of what that means. One thing I want to add to that too is I think it's really important. We mentioned it during the, the content portion, but um, not making color be a negative thing, right? Like, you know, I've seen um, situations where we'll be looking at the soccer field and, you know, trying to describe the kid and it's the one Indian kid out there and they're like the one with the long hair and the long legs. I mean, it's the one Indian kid out there. Like, it's okay to say that, right? Like, it's, 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 it's not, again, if you try to avoid addressing, you know, the fact that they're, they're different, you make it seem like it's something negative when it's not, right? When you walk up to somebody and, you know, you, you quickly can ascertain a couple of things, whether you want to or not, their age, you know, Sometimes they're most, you know, gender, um, that's questionable though. And then, you know, their skin color and, and things like that. So like you get a sense of who somebody is. So to identify me as the Indian woman, like that's not a bad thing. It, it is who I am. I'm proud of it. And, and when you're talking about kids, if they were to say something like that, um, we talked about this um, when we were preparing for the discussion, like if your kid is in a grocery store and identifies and says, you know, why is that um, man's skin color black, right? Like, it's okay for them to say that. It's okay for them to acknowledge it and to not make it like a negative thing. It's more important for, you know, um, not to like shush them away, right? And and it, just making sure that your reaction to it is okay versus rather like making what your kids say is, is bad, right? Um, Courtney, did we have any other ones? Otherwise, I'm ready. We did. Um, okay. the, actually, just now a follow-up to that. What if that Indian kid is Pakistani? Sure. I mean, you don't know. I mean, in my case, they're they're Indian, right? So uh, um, I'm Indian, I should say. And in some case, you don't know. So um, I know on a sidebar, my husband grew up in London and they would call all of the brown kids packies as like the derogatory term, right? Like that's how, you know, almost, oh, not exactly like an N-word, but like the same thing. Like they, they would call them packies to like make them feel bad, right? So um you know, unless you know, then it probably doesn't make sense. But like, it, it's okay to, in, in my opinion, and you guys, the rest of the panelists can can chime in as well. But I think it's okay to identify them as like the darker skin, right? Or the brown, brown chocolate or whatever you want to say. Again, in, in, as long as it's not in a negative way. So yeah, I mean, don't make assumptions that they're one ethnicity versus another. Yeah, and I would say build on that because it's something that definitely we experience a lot in the Latin community because we're comprised of many cultures on there. And so, you know, um, when people default, they see someone who's Latin, it's like, oh, he's Mexican. I'm like, well, you know, there's other ethnicities beyond, you know, Mexican, there's Bolivian, there's, you know, Cuban, there's a lot. And so that's definitely one thing I try to reinforce. It's like, oh, that's interesting, but perhaps it could also be something else, you know, but um, I think it's more like as, you know, what I try to strive for is to acknowledge the fact, like, acknowledge the fact, positively acknowledge, like, oh, that's interesting, yes, possibly, but also be able to reinforce that there are other communities, you know, who may look very similar that exist, um, and to recognize that there's a much bigger, you know, world beyond just what he may see or know of what this person may represent. Okay. Um, anyone have any other thoughts on that? Actually, one thing that it kind of occurred to me as we were talking about this is that, you know, perhaps ironic, maybe this is meta, but we're, we're kind of having this conversation as though the parent we're thinking about is white. And it's also the case that, so for instance, that because we're sort of saying like, okay, how is it, you know, a white parent handle a sensitive issue of, you know, talking about race when you identify race for kids. There's also the issue of what if your, you know, kids are not, are not white. And, and one thing, um, that I, you know, my oldest is eight. So we've had, you know, we've had race conversations with her. One, just in terms of the fact that she looks different from her you know, peers and classmates and things like that. And, and, and just, and which is natural for her. So it's not a big thing, but 
there's also the space of, you know, teaching our kids grace and resilience that, you know, your peers aren't always going to get it right. They're not going to say the right thing all the time. And, and just as was coming up in the chat, the issues of Indian versus Pakistani, Anjali was talking about some of the bigoted terms for Pakistani kids in, 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 um, in Britain. And you might have someone, I, I remember when I was a kid, another kid called me colored and really didn't understand that that was offensive. And it, it was taken aback, but thankfully I kind of realized in the moment, okay, he doesn't really understand. He's not trying to offend. It, let me not escalate by being offended though. Let me try to figure, also let him know mm, that's not necessarily cool. So I think, so there's, you know, teaching our kids about like how they should act, how, you know, relate, but also teaching our kids like, and you're gonna get it wrong. Like you're, you're gonna get it wrong. Like diversity, you live in a community that's not only racially diverse, it's gender diverse, experience diverse. You know, sometimes people are going to say the wrong thing to you and you're going to say the wrong thing. Show grace. Don't, don't get mad immediately. Hear the person out. And if the person continues to decide, this happens too, decides that like, no, they enjoy being ignorant. Then it's, it's also okay to walk away and just say, eh, you don't have to be friends with everybody. And, and also just to clarify, yeah, the, um, the term was used in a derogatory way towards my husband, so right? So that, that was um, the reference to it. Um, other, I see a couple of other questions. Courtney, I don't know if you had one ready. Um, the next one, can you give a tangible example of how I can tell if I'm acting colorblind in conversation and in action? I can offer something quick on that. Um, I like to try to balance both um, the desire to promote the culture race, to promote the, the beauty of diversity. I think at Wheaton, if I were to um, sort of describe my experience here, I think we try to embrace diversity in certain ways. I see it in the schools, I see it in different efforts. Um, what I think might be a little bit more lacking and dangerous is a colorblind a subtle color, colorblind ideology that might say, um, treat everybody the same. We all have the same color blood or whatever people say. And in education where that can be damaging, and I, I don't wanna offend anyone, I'm talking about myself, is recognizing that the way whiteness has been constructed, I'm talking about, uh, well, actually anybody can buy into this ideology of, of white supremacy, is it so deeply rooted that we don't always know that we hold biases about people and children based on their skin color. So for a teacher to say, I don't see race in my classroom, what it's actually doing is it's allowing possible unconscious bias to exist where we might think that children of color are less inherently intelligent. We might explain these gaps I mentioned earlier as anything other than systemic issues. And so I think that's some of the, a tangible example would be leaders and teachers and uh, people, decision makers um, saying they don't see race and not explaining the data according to um, systemic, uh, systemic injustices that impact and, and, and create disparities by race rather than uh, interrogating and are investigating the possibility of us actually holding deeply rooted um, biases and assumptions about people that are very negative and destructive and that allow us to tolerate these these gaps for so long rather than saying this is not okay and i think that's a tangible example i think felicia asked that question that i think i tend more to see the damage and the consequences of that but of course also not embracing the beauty and the benefits of diversity by saying i don't see race i would, I would also add to it too is um i think a big one is denying somebody's experience, right? So a very tangible experience that I've felt a lot is where I'll, I'll voice something where I've experienced it and I experienced it a couple times. I'm like, you know, something's off here. I, 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 it's, it keeps happening to me. And then I think that it has to do with just because perhaps, you know, of, of my skin color and, and to completely deny that. Um, no, I don't think it has anything to do with that. It could be because of this reason instead. That's a very um, tangible way that, that you might be. Uh, just to add on to that, we've seen that a lot, right, with people's explanations of uh, police shootings um, and other, you know, egregious acts, um, a very colorblind way of thinking about it is we don't know all the facts or this wasn't motivated by race when our community, of our friends of color are all over saying, I, I recognize this, this, this feels very familiar and it's really denying 
um, people what they're saying. We're not listening when we when we come at it with we don't know whether this was motivated by race. It's another example to build on to Anjali's example. Uh, I think you have. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Michael. Well. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as I was thinking of this question, it made me realize, I was thinking like, oh, what are tangible examples? And it made me realize like, colorblindness is usually, it's not what you say, it's what you don't say. I mean, I, I think a lot of these points have been hit, but it's like what you say or you don't, you know, what you don't say or what you don't assume. And it's really just saying that, you know, anything about race can't be a reason here. And, and kind of tying to something Mary said about historical nature of race, um, historical explanations can't be involved here. So I, I, one thing that came to mind I, my wife and I were foster parents for about a year and a half. And when we got our training, one of the things that came up was, you know, what if you get a child of a, of a different race? And one of the people on the training was saying like, I mean, one of the people, you know, becoming a foster parent said like, yeah, I mean, if I, if I have, if I were to get a black child, I don't even know like what you know, shows to show them or, you know, it would be a good doll to get. And, and we were talking about this and I said, well, and she, and our, you know, and our neighborhood is mostly white and I, and, and that would be uncomfortable. And I said, well, if you get a child who is black, one of the first things I might ask is, if they feel comfortable talking about race, is why are there no other black people around? And so the woman, and again, she was she was being very honest, and you know, and I'm not trying to insult her, but she said, well, I would explain to them that sometimes people of the same race don't want to live near each other. And and, I, and, I, and when she said that, it's like, or you could say that America has a history of segregation, and that's why our suburbs are segregated. And it, and, it, and 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 that's that's like true blindness. Like you really don't know that the history of the suburbs is history of segregation. Like that's like, it, it wasn't like Jim Crow big sign segregation, but the history of the suburbs is a history of segregation. And, and so it's almost like if you're truly blind, you don't even kind of see, it's like what you don't see, what you don't know. And that's why, and that's tied to why it's so a point, it's so important to have people in your life that have those different experiences. Again, going to what Mary said about having teachers, having real you know, friendships and relationships with people of different experiences so they can see a thing that you wouldn't see. And, and that just, again, that just comes with building community. That's why we have to have diverse community because otherwise we won't see things that we don't see. So I know we're over in time here, so we'll do just maybe two more questions. Um, Courtney, I think you have one more, and then I'll, I'll do one, I have one for you, Erica, and then we'll, we'll try to wrap things up. Okay, I have one here. Um, how do you deal with the friends of your kids that are colorblind? Do you address it or do you just let it be? Let it be. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I let, uh, I would, as a, I'm not going to speak as a parent, right? I mean, because we can relate to each other on so many different levels. One of the things we can relate to each other for those of us parents as parents, uh, I don't want to be in the business of parenting somebody else's kids. Uh, I, I, I think that's overstepping a bound. I think if, if a child says something to your, and this is something I think about a lot. Uh, I remember when we moved to Wheaton, I said to my wife, because at that point we just had one child, our oldest daughter, I said, you know, the, the the number one thing that would break my heart is if our daughter came home and told me her, her hair was ugly, um, which thankfully has never happened. In fact, I just feel so blessed by Lincoln Elementary. I think they do a wonderful job. I just think, I just want to shout out to Lincoln Elementary. I think it's a wonderful school. Um, and But if someone did insult her hair, I wouldn't tell, I wouldn't think it's my responsibility to go correct that child. I would think it's my responsibility to tell my child why her hair is gorgeous. Yeah. To add just a little bit of a personal experience to um, my daughters, they're about two years apart for anybody um, who knows them and very different. They don't look the same, you know, different heights and everything like that. But one of their pet peeves is um, people not being able to tell them apart, right? Um, typically because, you know, kind of going back to that media, um, what, what, what you see we li and what um, I showed in that little clip, like we, we live in a predominantly white community. So our faces are slightly different. I'm often mistaken as the other, um, you know, brown girl's mom. The, my daughters can't be told apart even though they look nothing alike. So, I mean, there's some areas where, you know, other children can, we, we try to talk about it and be like, hey, you know, like, let's take a minute. Let's actually look at the two girls and see who the, what the difference is. I mean, it's happened with like teachers who've had them in their class for years too. So um, it's, it's a common thing for them, but they get really irritated by that. So there, there are certain circumstances where, you know, I try to push it a little bit and be like, look, this is important for you to be able to see my kids. 
Um, and so I probably push the limits in there, but yeah, you know, like Michael said, it is somewhat hard. I probably start with the parents maybe, and then, they, and then go down um, a little bit, but that's, that's, that's my take of it. Yeah, I would just like add on that too. I think what Michael and Anjali had said is well, talk to your children about it, like acknowledge, like I think that's the more important conversation because I think ignoring it all together, it, you know, it just doesn't, your child is likely processing that or maybe he's unaware of that. And I think it's important for them to start to become aware of like, hey, you know what, this, this you know, something he said, you know, he or she said maybe it wasn't intended that way, but you know, it could be misinterpreted and it's important for you to understand those differences. Um, because he or she's likely to encounter it down the road. I think having the kids stand up for themselves is big too, right? Yeah. I, I feel like um, my kids are super proud. So <laughs> they'll, they'll be quick. And also like, um, sorry, just another quick example. They're often asked if they're the other, I keep talking about Indian because we're Indian, but we, you know, um, if they're the other brown kid's cousin, right? And, and then, you know, they'll might be something, well, are you guys brother and sister because you're both white? Like there's, there's some, <laughs> aspect of, of, of that too, right? And trying to um, make another person see how silly some of their statements can be. And, and uh, to Rachel's, I'm oh, sorry, and to, and to Rachel's point about, um, or, uh, I think it was Rachel said, maybe it was Anjali, about talking to the parents. Again, he heads up to parents, uh, kind of building what you said, Anjali, are they cousins? One thing I got a lot as a kid, because I got, to, I went to a predominantly white school, was there were about two other black girls in my class. And so there's there like three black boys, including me, two black girls. So like on any given month, there's a rumor that the two of us like each other or something like that because we're black. Um, please tell your kids not to do that. It's really annoying. Um, and, and I will say this, there, there are a few friends of my daughters that they're so close to us. Like they just come over all the time. They're so close. I might feel a little comfortable speaking to them, but that's like if we really have a tight relationship. Otherwise, I, yeah, I either work with your kids, work with the parents, but I never want to parent anybody else's kids. So I'll go ahead and ask the last question, um, unless you guys have anything super pressing, but uh, I wanted to ask this one to Erica. Um, where did it go? By talking about skin color, are we headed into anti-white policies or reverse racism? Ooh, that's a big one. It's a question that I got on a, a Facebook chat. So, oh, you know, okay. real, real question. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's a real tough one. Um, so, and just for clarity, repeat it one more time. Yeah. Um, by talking about skin color, are we headed into anti-white policies or reverse racism? Right. So, I think that the uh, general consensus, and, and I believe this, and again, I'm not in a lot of powerful rooms, um, and I don't do giant loads of research, um, but the ism, the racism, the discrimination, the bias comes from who has power. So if you look at it as a, dy a power dynamic, um, you know, you look at who our leaders are, and, and I'm just going to say this and, and be straightforward here because I think we're all being real honest. Um, I had my government students watch the debate the other night, right? And we actually do, I've done this for years, and we compared it to the Nixon-Kennedy debate, because 1960, it's the big TV um, one, so it's a history. And I actually had one kid ask, one student just asked on our Zoom meeting, um, like, how come it hasn't changed? How come everybody on the stage is white? So I, I thought, so we, we processed through that and talked about how that's an interesting observation. That's a truthful observation. Why did you say that? Why do you think that? What do you guys think? So I, as a teacher, turned it into a discussion and let's talk about what we think about it. And it wasn't a, yeah, there should be less, you know, white people on stage. It, it didn't turn that way and you, have, you do have to be careful. Um, but again, there's a power dynamic and we have to recognize that um, who's in the boardrooms, who's in government, who's in leadership positions, um, where, you know, you, we just have to recognize that. So I, I think acknowledging color is acknowledging everyone's experiences. And, and that's about where we're at right now. <laughs> I said one last one, but there was one more in the chat that we wanted to make sure we addressed. Um, and I think Michael, this would probably go to you because uh, it was your question, but like, why is color, color defensive? Yeah, I saw that, so I'm glad I have a chance to answer it. Um, 
I think, and, and actually, I think I, I might have a slightly different answer today than when I first had that experience when I was, when I was a kid. Um, just the word colored at that time had to me like connotations of sort of Jim Crow and my, my big association with the word came from, you know, things I'd seen in documentaries about the civil rights movement. So you said colored, it, it, you know, just rang in my ear in that negative way. I think if, I mean, today I very comfortably refer to myself as a person of color. So I think today I actually would have no problem with the word at all. But when that was first said to me, and again, thinking of my age, probably the early 90s, it was just more associated with me from issues of segregation. So I think then it just had a connotation, I think. And so there's just so much like, and, and I think it goes back to what I was saying about like, how we talk to each other with issues of, of, of race, like um, words might mean different things to people. And so you just have grace with each other and talk out because I think actually to uh, whoever asked this question, my friend, when I voiced an issue, he said, well, what's wrong with that? And I think even at the time, I, I think I was about like maybe 12, 13, even at the time I was like, well, it just, you know, I, it just feels this way to me. And he heard what I was saying. And he's like, oh, okay. And then we were cool. I mean, we just went back to, we were at school, we went back to doing what we were doing. So it's just the association, but I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with the word itself. I think also tone has a yes. lot to do with things. Tone, situation, circumstances. Um, I talked to somebody about the, you know, recently when I was asked where I was, where I was going and people of color um, often in predominantly white areas are like that, the question of belonging comes in a lot, but tone and the way that, you know, somebody looks at you and stuff like that, that can also influence, I think, your your reaction to somebody calling you colored, I think. Um, yeah, so I think that has a lot to do with it too. Um, I wanted to see if there was any other closing points. Not too bad, about 20 minutes over. I know we're over, but Anjali, I can actually make a really strong plug for our next conversation that okay. I'll participate um, as an observer in. I think the question that was asked actually hits on a really close to home, on a feeling many white people are experiencing, whether we say it or not, and that is, are we, is the, is the country as we've known it to be and love it to be being, you know, overthrown by the other? And I think that's rooted in some level of entitlement, uh, assumptions of what it means to be an American, and a deeply rooted fear that there's not enough. So even if you just look at affirmative action and many examples across society is a deeply rooted feeling that some sort of uh, a claim or stake or entitlement to access to every opportunity is being threatened by talking about race is we, we should really look back and see what are what what foundational ideologies are even producing that question in a society that claims to be beyond beyond race. And I think Erica hit it pretty square on the head is that if, if we're raised to believe that these opportunities are for us and our communities are for us, um, we're, we're seeing that unfortunately. But um, the idea of, of white fragility sort of gets really deep into that. That's Robin D'Angelo's work and Angeli is gonna lead in that conversation next time. So we hope you all tune in again, but I actually see Tim Callahan has a question. So I'll let somebody else, I have lots of answers to that. I'll let someone else talk. Yeah, I know we're, lo we're losing people, but, um, you know, I also don't want to, like, avoid especially our audience questions, not the ones that we have, up at, uh, uh, you know, here. So if you guys have to go, we understand. Um, Tim Callahan asks that if there was one movie to watch um, to help grow the understanding of history of race in America, what would you suggest? And Mary is <laughs> strongly 13th. I think 13th as well. Do you guys have other questions or uh, uh, answers, I, was... I mean? I want to suggest The Long Shadow. We did a, a viewing of that through the IEA. The Long Shadow does a great job of getting at what Michael was talking about too with the suburbs. Um, I think that was even as a history teacher, that was eye-opening for me. Another one too is that there's a podcast um, that I came across. It's um, seenonradio.org, Seen White. And it basically is, you know, breaks down, like, what is the history of race? Like, where does this notion of whiteness come from? What does it mean? And, you know, kind of starts to talk about this concept of race and how did we, you know, the history of that. So I thought that was a really interesting one as well. And just to, right. I was just going to reiterate, 13th is on Netflix, in case anybody didn't know. Um, go ahead, Michael. Oh, yeah, I was going to say Selma by the same uh, director of, of 13th. I think seeing that movie it just hit me in a visceral way, like what it really meant to have to fight for rights in your own country and just how scary that would have been to do. Um, and I think it 
just really brings home the realities of of segregation and that violence more so than anything I'd ever read. It's just like what I think it just gives you that visceral feel of you just you want to you literally want to walk across your state and your own government hates you and wants to kill you for doing it. And I think that just it just drives home like wow this this is America. Courtney, I'm, I'm taking over your role here, but I have, I see one last question. Um, and I know this one in particular because it came um, up in, um, you know, as DEI 200, we sent out that survey and I saw this in a lot of responses. Um, and I think this is something very um, specific in our in our community that's happening, but there there's something called the N-word passes. Um, so that's something that definitely needs to be addressed. Um, absolutely not appropriate, but um, for those of you who don't know, there is there are, um, I think, especially at the middle school level, um, kids are asking uh, the black kids to ha get a pass so they have the ability to say the n-word. Not okay, not appropriate, needs to be nipped in the butt, and I think that's something that we definitely need to work on with our administrators and, and how, do we, how do we do that. I think everybody's in agreement there. Yep. All right, so again, I wanna thank everybody, um, especially our panelists. Thank you guys for, for helping me answer these difficult questions, participating in this, um, all the participants who came. Um, and of course, Courtney, <laughs> thank you so much for be willing to host these difficult conversations. Absolutely. I, I appreciate it. And I definitely hope you guys will all tune in again on the um, November 5th. Uh, you know, discussion and, um, you know, with, with more content and, and more Q&A. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're really looking forward to doing more of these programs. So we hope you join us.